I'd like to first start out by asking each of the panelists to introduce themselves. They are, of course, here for a reason. They are each experts in their respected fields, and so I'd like to ask you all to introduce yourselves. Hello, I'm Dr. Michael Stein. I am a professor here at RIT and TID. As well, I am a practicing attorney. Before I came to RIT, I worked for the National Association of the Deaf, the NAD. There I was involved in a variety of different cases. Some suits involved hospitals not providing interpreters. Currently, I'm working with the NAD and my own law firm suing a medical school in Nebraska that just recently went to trial. I've also had some experience pursuing state boards of pharmacy, and I'll explain more about that later. So I've been involved in a variety of different cases involving people who are deaf wanting to pursue medical careers. And I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Deaf and hard of hearing professionals' involvement in the healthcare field is a relatively new concept. It is our hope that they tackle the world's future problems. Thank you, Michael, for all your past contributions. And next we have Tiffany. Hi, my name is Tiffany Panko. I'm currently a second year medical student at the University of Rochester. Before that, I worked as a research coordinator at the National Center on Deaf Health Research. And before that, I was a student. I got a degree from RIT here, a bachelor's degree, and I also got an MBA. So here I am. Hello everyone, my name is Scott Smith. I graduated from medical school around 16 years ago. I'm a pediatrician by training. I work at Rochester General Hospital, I'll call it RGH. I've done that for about four and a half years now, seeing patients, both hearing and deaf. I then transferred to the University of Rochester where I am an assistant professor in the Department of Public Health Sciences. I focus mainly on research centered around improving deaf people's health, their health literacy, and awareness. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, it really is a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Richard Doolittle, and I serve as the vice dean and professor in the College of Health Science and Technology here at RIT. Uh, I, I graduated from the University of Rochester uh, earning a, a dual degree, and PhD in anatomy and pathology, and uh, came to RIT in 1986, a long time ago. And since uh, that time, I've been pretty actively involved in, in uh, teaching and, and research, um, and um, have been uh, working closely with deaf and hard of hearing students since that, those very early days. And it's been exciting to see the changes that have opened up the doors uh, for this population. And even today, uh, teaching um, and still engaged actively in research, I've got uh, deaf students working with me today. So it's just been great to see that transition over time. Good evening, my name is Bob Pollard. I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm a professor of psychiatry at the University of Rochester. Uh, medical Center, and uh, I've been there since 1990, and uh, I was the first person in my department, in the Department of Psychiatry, who was dealing directly with uh, deaf persons, uh, and because it was part of the medical school, I began to do teaching uh, on a variety of levels regarding deaf people in the field of medicine, etc., and uh, over time began to serve as somewhat of a consultant when we had deaf or hard of hearing individuals uh, interacting with a medical school as students or residents or otherwise. Uh, and in addition, I do a, a lot of uh, forensic work. Uh, and a good number of the cases that I've been involved with are Americans with Disabilities Act related cases pertaining to deaf people pursuing healthcare careers. And so that's. Uh, one of the um, experiences that, uh, that I've had that we'll um, be talking about tonight. One thing we would like to talk about is diversity. As you can see, we do have a diverse panel here tonight. Diversity is important, especially in the medical field. Now I'm wondering, are there many female physicians in the medical field? We do have Tiffany here, 
who is an up-and-coming professional, but can you speak to the diversity in the medical field? What are your experiences and what have you seen? That's pretty common among medical schools. They value diversity. And most of the time, when you're applying to medical school, they'll ask about how you can contribute to their diversity efforts. So absolutely, medical schools are looking for diverse applicants and diversity. However, at the same time, we need more diversity as far as deaf and hard of hearing people in the workforce. So far, we have seen mostly white individuals, a few women, yes, finally. We are seeing more and more of them. But the point is, we need more diversity in all areas, including race and gender within the deaf and hard of hearing workforce, not just within the hearing workforce. Richard, you are responsible for the College of Healthcare Science and Technology here at RIT. Can you share the requirements to enter your college and the programs your college offers? And what are the healthcare related careers related to the programs here at RIT? At this current time, the, the college has been in existence for two years now. Uh, what we've done is we've brought existing programs under our umbrella. So we have a physician assistant program that's been going for 20 years. Uh, we have a, a diagnostic medical sonography program, ultrasound program that we're expanding to echocardiography or ultrasound of the heart. Uh, we have a nutrition program uh, and then we have uh, the largest program is our biomedical science program. That program has got a lot of uh, flexibility in it. It offers a lot of uh, science elective credits, general elective credits. So students can kind of design um, their curriculum to go in one direction or another. We have a series of focal areas within that. There are different re entrance requirements for, for those programs. I would say that the program that is um, attracting the largest number of deaf and hard of hearing students would be the biomedical science program. But uh, we do have two students in our, our physician assistant program. We have had a number of students come through our ultrasound program in the past. Uh, same with respect to our nutrition program. So in terms of competitiveness, uh, the PA program is, is highly competitive, especially for transfer students uh, is the most difficult to get into. Um, but we have students that move across these majors. They find out after a year they want to be in a different major. They'll change their mind, change their major. So uh, the doors are, are open to those students who are qualified. Uh, and so we, we want to continue to encourage uh, those students of the deaf and uh, hard of hearing population to look into our programs. As a new college, we are slated to grow. Um, one of the areas we hope to grow in is in behavioral medicine uh, and mental health uh, areas. So we're looking at social work, we're looking at clinical psychology, uh, specifically within the forensics area, um, as, as potential new programs, especially at the graduate level, that we think will also serve as an attractant for, for deaf and hard of hearing students. So it's a, it's a time of, of great potential growth for us, and we're still defining what that strategic future would be for our college. My next question relates to access within medical schools. In order to be accepted into medical school, one must take a medical college admissions test, or MCAT. Can you please talk about what the MCAT looks like and how students can better prepare for the exam? Also, what is the average MCAT score and GPA requirement in order to be accepted into medical school? Tiffany, I know you were recently accepted into medical school, so can you please answer that question first? First, let me talk about how to prepare for the MCAT. The test usually is offered uh, around May to August, I believe. If you take it in May, you need to start studying well before. I would say start studying around November. There's also preparatory courses that are offered. They're very expensive, though. I'd rather save my money so that I could pay for school. So I instead got a book. I set a schedule for myself, and I took some practice tests. I would buy more practice materials along the way as well. I continuously studied until I sat for the exam in May. The average score for the MCAT is about 24. The maximum score is 45. That, to be honest, is really hard to achieve. A good score is 30. 35 is quite impressive. You should aim for 30. The average, as I mentioned, is 24. I think schools like to see a minimum of 20 or 21 for admission. It really depends on the school. Now, before I applied to medical school, I did some library research. There was one publication 
the MSAR, I think. I can't remember the acronym right now, but it was from the American Association of Medical Colleges. Yes. They publish this publication annually, and they publish the average MCAT scores and the average GPA scores for each medical college. Some were more competitive, some were more flexible. At the same time, I was able to compare public versus private schools. There was a lot of information that I could use from that publication. And from that research, I then narrowed down where I wanted to apply. Clearly, you can't afford to apply to every medical school. As far as GPA goes, 3.0 is the minimum, 3.5 is much better, and 4.0 is great. But a minimum of 3 I would recommend. For that type of really big exam, you have to be preparing far in advance. You can't just start preparing last minute, obviously. There is so much information included in these tests. You really have to try and understand the concepts, not just memorize information. Memorization does have its place, yes, but the point is to practice reading exam questions. I would say I took over a hundred practice tests, and I think that really helped me to experience the flavor of the types of questions and how they were phrased. Really, the point is to understand the concepts. Be able to explain in simple words what the point of the question was, and why did they ask that question. Just trying to understand the underlying concept, like you were trying to explain it to your mother or grandmother, for example. Try to envision that, and you should be successful. Then, if you have any questions related to that specific concept, it may improve your chances to get the right answer. But really, the point is practice. You have to take a course. Some people say that a course is beneficial, but I didn't take a course, I just practiced on my own. Just 10 different books to read and study over and over until I got used to the time limit imposed by the exam. Can you talk about some of the challenges that you have faced transitioning into medical school? You need to set a rigorous schedule for yourself and ensure that you're studying basically every day. At the same time, it's important that you have balance. You can't study 100% of the time. You'd go a little crazy. So you want to show your family and friends that you still care about them and make time for them. Balance is a huge part of it. As far as the material goes, the information can be overwhelming at times. I just took a two-week intensive course, so I'm still getting used to discerning my needs. Sometimes I have to decide whether I want to request interpreting services or CART services. It really depends on the situation. So these are some of the new experiences I've encountered. For me, going to medical school was almost like learning a new language. You know, all these different terms are being thrown at you. It was overwhelming at times. I think the key that helped me was having good interpreters there. Interpreters who were willing to work with me as a team. There would be two interpreters at the same time. There would be the off interpreter listening to the lecture and writing down words. If there was a term that was used where they didn't know a sign for it or what that word meant, the off interpreter would write it down and then after class or at the end of the day, the three of us would meet together and discuss what the words meant and bring a medical dictionary to look them up in. Oftentimes, words were divided into their root words, their suffixes and prefixes, and then we would make up a sign for each part of the word and then combine them. For example, hyper meant high. And that would be one part of the word, high. Or hypertension, high pressure, high blood pressure. Anytime the interpreter heard the word hyper, automatically they would know, ah, that means high. Or hyperthyroidism is another related example. That was a big challenge, learning a new language. Scott, you make some great points that lead me to my next question. I know that we have experts here on the panel 
who have worked with deaf and hard of hearing people transitioning into the medical field. My question now relates to the legal aspects. So Michael, as an attorney, you have been involved in some cases involving litigation relating to students trying to get access to education and get access services in medical schools. Can you share some of the information in the cases you participated in? Certainly. I'll comment about a few of my cases. Before this, I'd like to emphasize that most people have had very positive experiences when applying to medical school and to graduate school. For the most part, people have positive experiences. I'm going to talk about some of those unfortunate experiences where people did not get services. So don't think this applies to all. For example, we have Tiffany, who's been very successful getting services in her program. First, I'd like to comment about a suit that's occurring in the state of Nebraska. I happen to have a client who's deaf, who applied for medical school, and was accepted. And upon entering the school, he requested several accommodations, CART, an oral interpreter, because he grew up with no knowledge of sign language. So he felt he could benefit from an oral interpreter or a huge speech translator. And possibly an FM system may provide some assistance, but it hasn't been successful so far for him. And the medical school reviewed his application and said that they provide an FM system, that that would suffice for his needs. The student decided to go ahead with that accommodation, even though it wasn't his first choice. Now, let me explain about the ADA. The ADA does not mandate the use of a sign language interpreter. The ADA states that you have the right to effective communication. Again, effective communication, not the right to a sign language interpreter. Which means, well, one of several things. If you need an interpreter to communicate, then you have a right to an interpreter. However, another deaf person may do just fine one-on-one -on -one in small group conversations and not need an interpreter in those circumstances. So they don't have that same right. Your right depends on your communication skills, your communication needs. So the medical school felt that they were complying with the ADA, that this person didn't need the services of an interpreter or a CART at all. They felt the FM system was sufficient enough. And the student said, okay, I'll try this for a short time. And so he entered medical school for the first month with the use of this FM system. It was a difficult struggle. He wasn't able to follow along. He wasn't able to understand what was happening in the educational process. He explained that he needed something different than the FM system, especially in the lab environment. The medical school denied this request so that he didn't need the services of an interpreter. It's analogous to if you're driving a car. Any car that moves works for you. You don't need a fancy car. You don't need a Cadillac. So it's analogous to the school's response. You don't need cart services. You don't need an oral interpreter. We are compliant with the law. And what the student decided to do was that he certainly needed the cart services and the services of interpreters. So he borrowed some money from his parents to purchase these services on his own. The cost was about fifty to sixty thousand dollars per year. Then a lawsuit was filed, and it's taken four years for this case to finally go to trial. We were victorious in the suit, but it's not over yet. The judge now has the opportunity to determine what is next. The student has finished only two years of school and is into his third year of school, so the judge will decide what the student needs for the third and fourth year only. I mention this case because it gives you a sense of what your rights can look like. Remember again, you don't have the right to an interpreter per se. You have the right to effective communication. And what is meant by effective communication depends on your individual circumstances. One person may need an interpreter, or another person it doesn't mean that. CART may suffice, or other services. It depends on the individual person. First is the general issue of what's called technical standards. After the ADA was passed, 
um, professional schools, in particular professional schools in the healthcare fields, um, developed these policies that are referred to as technical standards, which set forth the, uh, the physical requirements that a student or a graduate would need to be able to accomplish in order to either be enrolled in the school or graduate from the school. And these uh, policies are very, very powerful and important. And anybody who's applying to a healthcare school uh, will be able to read in, in the school's uh, policies and documentations what their technical standards are. And these technical standards uh, were a way for the school to try and uh, determine who will or won't be capable of doing the physical requirements necessary for patient care, let's say, uh, in, that particular, in that particular field. The problem with the way the technical standards documents are often written is they're written by not, not just hearing people, but people who don't have experience with disabilities more often than not. And so they, as they think about how to write these policies about what you have to be able to do physically, they'll often think, well, what would I, as a, let's say, hearing uh, person who doesn't use a wheelchair or has no visual problems or any other type of, of disabilities, how would I try to accomplish the things that are required in our program? And so, unfortunately, these standards are often written in what I refer to as an organic way, meaning a, a, a physically focused way. They'll say you have to see this well to be in our program or graduate from our program. Or you have to hear this well to be able to enroll or graduate from our program. You have to be able to lift this many pounds, etc. cetera. Um, in contrast to that philosophy, this organic, strongly physical focused philosophy, a very rare uh, number of, of, of healthcare schools will write these standards in a way that I agree with, which I refer to as a functional manner, in which case they don't dictate the amount of sight or hearing or lifting ability you have to have, but they simply say what you have to accomplish, such as you have to be able to detect a heart murmur or you have to be able to detect uh, a lung sound or, 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 or determine a broken bone in an x-ray. Uh, the point being that they don't say how you have to do it, whether it's through your hearing or through your vision or through your uh, legs or what have you, but they say you have to accomplish these things for your patients. And how you accomplish those things, whether it is through your hearing or through a stethoscope that uh, that uh, many deaf healthcare professionals use that may show its uh, uh, its output on a, on a visual screen, it doesn't matter. You just have to accomplish these physical things. The, the, you have to accomplish these functional things for your patients. And in a number of the lawsuits I've been in, it's this issue of technical standards being written in a organic way versus a functional way, which becomes uh, a, a, a focus of what's wrong with the particular school's policies. There's a number of other things that I could mention that come from my experience in these lawsuits. I'll, I'll mention them briefly. First of all uh, uh, would be the issue of how a school deals with reasonable accommodations during the didactic or classroom portions of training compared with the portions of training where you begin to interact with patients. In my experience in these, in these uh, cases, uh, a number of schools will feel comfortable providing reasonable accommodations for the classroom didactic portion of a student's education, but as soon as they start dealing with patients or that, that time in their education arrives, the, uh, uh, the faculty of the school become very frightened about whether or not a deaf individual uh, will uh, be dangerous, shall we say, in serving, uh, in serving uh, patients. And that, that opens up a number of other uh, concerns that have to be addressed, unfortunately, after the student has already been enrolled. Um, another issue that's important in these cases is that many schools who are worried about a deaf individual taking care of patients will hypothesize about some long-term future situation where the deaf individual is out there in independent practice and 
some strange situation might occur where they don't hear something and the patient uh, is in danger, et cetera, when in reality the legal, and Michael will of course correct me if, if I say anything <coughs> wrong here, where the legal issue at hand is what's happening in school. The legal matter is, is uh, what safety issues or legal issues, et cetera, pertain to your school education. Not some strange situation 10 years from now when you're in independent practice in the middle of Alaska and you can't hear something. And, <laughs> and in my experience, these, these lawsuits will often have persons uh, uh, speculating these bizarre circumstances that don't pertain to the actual school situation itself. And the school situation itself always involves students being surrounded by numerous teachers and other individuals who provide many levels of supervision and safety that just don't make any sense in comparison to these bizarre stories they're thinking of five years down the road in the middle of Alaska. So it's important in these lawsuits to keep the focus on if people are concerned about patient safety, what's the real true patient situation, the patient safety situation in the school environment where a student is always going to be surrounded by numerous uh, colleagues and supervisors who are watching their work and making sure that patients are safe and keeping the reality of that situation in the forefront of, of the case. That's helpful information. We have a question from the audience. The question is, I notice a common problem is people will progress through medical school, but post-medical school they experience issues of them focusing on their inability to hear. So I'm wondering, what have you done to overcome that general discrimination out in the real world? That is not a simple question. Discrimination is still alive and well in the world today. Even though I've gone through medical school and now have my MD, it is still not always easy to convince, uh, you could say, naive hearing people that deaf people can do it. It is also hard to convince them of the cost involved, because interpreting services are unfortunately not cheap. A lot of hearing people are resistant to that. An ADA does not, unfortunately, have its own funds to pay for interpreters. The ADA really forces me as a deaf professional to negotiate with the hospitals and other companies as far as how to accommodate what I'm looking for. Like Michael was talking about reasonable accommodations, it's a negotiation. It depends on the situation as well. It's not a perfect world yet, but I think we still have a lot of work to do as far as educating the hearing world. The ADA requires an interactive process to be pursued. What that means is that if, for example, if I am a doctor who's deaf and a hospital hires me, certainly you want to be grateful for the opportunity, but you also let the hospital know what your needs are. But it's not automatic that you get those services for those needs. You sit down and you have that discussion. What is reasonable? What is effective? What is not effective? You consider the costs and other issues during those negotiations. So it's important that you sit down with your employer and have that discussion about what is necessary for effective communication. Often, many hospitals are concerned not just about the costs, but also about people they've served in the past, and they have some fears about mishaps that may result because of providing certain services. I was involved in a lawsuit about five years ago involving the state of Alabama. There happened to be a pharmacy that hired a deaf pharmacist. And they were concerned about the deaf pharmacist using video phones through the video relay service, calling doctors about orders, concerned about misunderstandings, about the names of certain prescriptions. They were concerned that there would be a mishap through using video relay services, so they did not want that to be pursued. Also, the State Board of Pharmacy prohibited the use 
of interpreters through VRS, through the relay services, for prescription orders. The pharmacist would have to call the physician to collect information on a certain prescription, the amount, the name, and they forbid the use of video relay service because the state board stated that only licensed pharmacists could receive the orders for prescriptions. Unlicensed pharmacists could not. That was just a general rule. And as a result, the state board saw the use of an interpreter through the video relay service as not being a licensed pharmacist. They saw that this practice was forbidden. This decision didn't make sense. It wasn't logical. It was just that the State Board had never encountered this request before and decided to prohibit this practice. Many deaf medical professionals have to continue to educate and articulate uh, how these practices are safe and sound, how they are wise to utilize these services that are available. The State Board hired an expert person to test the system to see if using the video relay service was a safe means of putting in prescription orders. So they ran this test through the system and the results were 100% accurate. And therefore the state board decided this was a reasonable request and approved it for future use. So those who are deaf in the medical fields need to continually educate these different systems. Sometimes they're the first person in these particular fields and they have to share the strategies that are effective for them it's important that they sit down and engage in that interactive process to have that discussion about what works for them. The point, really, is that hearing people are not used to deaf people. So if the deaf person does something in a little bit of a different way, hearing people are thinking, oh, no, no, this is no good. So I think the point is, we have to show hearing people that, yes, we do things in a different way, but we have an equal outcome. The result is still good and equivalent to a hearing person's. Understand, we do it in a different way, but get the same result. I think the key point is the outcomes. Stop focusing on the process. Don't get caught up on the process. Instead, focus on the results. I think it's true and somewhat unfortunate that, that deaf and hard of hearing individuals who, especially those young people who are still in training, are going to have a lifelong burden of being a teacher to hearing people. Um, on the other hand, uh, uh, if you have intermediaries, whether they're faculty who understand you, et cetera, who could sort of play some of that educational role on your behalf so that you don't have to add that burden to all your studying, everything else you're doing, that can be very useful. I, I, I often play that role in the medical center where I will, where, where they're anticipating that a deaf or hard of hearing person is going to become a medical student or an employee or a, a resident or whatever in a given department. I have this canned lecture that I do um, where I get invited to in, in, in a very actually nice way, kind of a hearing person talking to hearing people um, where they can let their guard down a little bit and uh, ask stupid questions if they want to ask stupid questions and not feel so defensive. Um, and I always, I always ask the deaf individual who we're going to be talking about, do you want to be there with me as we do this or do this together or would you rather I do this without you present? And actually more often than not, the deaf person will say, no, actually I'd rather you just do it without me there so that people can feel more comfortable to ask dumb questions or, or express their fears, et cetera. And I have found that, and I think others that I've worked with have found that very effective. So that's another possible choice that sometimes could be made. What resources are available for deaf and hard of hearing individuals who are out in the medical field? Are there any professional organizations or resources that they can take advantage of? There is an association for medical professionals with hearing loss. It's called the AMPHLA. 
Look at their website. There is a lot of useful information there, a lot of technical information as well, including stethoscopes, assistive devices, things that you can use in conjunction with a hearing aid or an implant. It's impossible to give a good answer to that question. It depends on the individual communication needs. How they do one-on-one, -on -one, they may do just fine without an interpreter. However, if their first language is ASL and they can't speak for themselves, they have a difficult time lip reading, that circumstances may require the use of an interpreter. So it depends on the individual communication needs and skills. If an interpreter is requested in a medical appointment and is denied, they determine that there isn't a need for an interpreter and a communication mishap occurs, then that's a different situation. My dream would be that we could all work together to change the ADA in order to have the government be able to give funds to cover the costs of accommodations. I say that because, in that way, we don't have to go through these negotiations with hospitals, with offices, with private practices. If I apply for a job, they can just hire me, and they wouldn't have to worry about the extra costs. So to me, I feel that that would really level the playing field for all of us, regardless of our communication needs. But unfortunately, the ADA was written over 20 years ago, and really there were not many deaf people involved with the writing of the ADA. The ADA is for more people with general disabilities. So I think, before that happens, what can we do? Educate, educate, educate. Get the word out there. We need to share our experiences with as many people as we can, so they understand why. You know, regardless of having a good quality education, good job performance, it's still hard for us to find better employment sometimes, largely because of costs. And still, that focus on our ability or inability to hear. Sorry, I don't have an easy answer yet. Thank you. I, I certainly agree that costs are a big issue and probably the hardest to resolve. Um, but another subset of discrimination is simply attitude and fearfulness and ignorance about a hearing person thinking, how could possibly a deaf person do X, Y, Z healthcare <coughs> occupation? And I think that is a, a, an, easier, uh, an easier problem to begin to address. Certainly, in my experience, talking to hearing people who otherwise didn't know about the Association of Medical Professionals with Hearing Loss opens their eyes to, oh, really, there's such a thing? or explaining about deaf medical doctors I know and deaf nurses I know and deaf psychologists I know uh, and that I can you know, talk about when I'm at trials or whatever or, or educating facilities. Oh, really? We've never heard of that. And so simply explaining that these things are possible uh, can be very helpful. And I try to sometimes compare it to, can you imagine you know, 100 years ago or even less when there were no female doctors? Or the idea, the, the, the crazy idea that we could never have a female president because she'd have PMS or something and, and start a nuclear war. Um, we have to work on changing attitudes. Uh, and the best way to do that is to show that there are more and more deaf people in the healthcare professions and that there are uh, uh, organizations which support them and there's technologies which are constantly improving, which make the make hearing loss less and less of a problem uh, in terms of uh, taking care of patients regardless of what profession you may be in. You may feel frustrated, dejected, and sometimes as a result decide to give up and pursue other careers. I encourage you not to do that. It is a hard and difficult journey. Your fight is well worth it, not just for yourself, but those who follow in your footsteps. You are the pioneers. You're opening the doors for future deaf people. I'll give you an example. When I attended law school, my law school asked me what services I needed, and we talked about the use of CART. And my lawyer asked me what I thought about that. And I'd learned that the person prior to me fought a battle for two years trying to get CART services. And as a result, the policy was set up where I had access to CART services. Everything was ready for me. 
and I owe a great deal of gratitude to my predecessor. So for those of you who are frustrated, please continue. Fight those battles for yourself and for those who will follow in your footsteps. I wouldn't advise you any differently than I advise any other student. I think we're at that point now, and certainly this is the, the culture that we've created within our college, which is we, we help students uh, pursue their goals and their dreams. And I, and I think that it comes down to what do you want to do? And, and the, the, the worst news I can hear from a student is, well, I, I really want to do this, but I'm, I'm afraid that they're not going to be able to support me. It's, well, we don't know that. Um, you've got to be able to, to, to put yourself out there and, and to go forward in, in confidently with the skills that you've created to pursue the career and the, and the program that you want to pursue. And, and it's not without uh, challenges. I was telling Michael about a student who's applying for dental school and he ran into uh, clear cases of discrimination, but he's, he's still working at it. And now he's got an early interview at the University of Maryland for dental school. And he's incredibly talented and very driven on what he wants to do. And I think it's those kinds of people that kick the doors open. They don't give up because they, they know what they want to do uh, with the training they've got and they just stay after it. I think that's a, a very important point. If a student has experienced discrimination, for example, in the process of applying for graduate school or medical school, or after they graduate from here, what are the appropriate steps a student can take instead of just giving up or saying, ADA gives me the right to accommodations? What do you recommend from a legal perspective? Or Tiffany, as a current student, is there anything you'd like to share? Oh, I agree. Uh, that cost, which we've all been talking about, are a factor. I face that experience where I've been wary of the costs involved. I was encouraged to request interpreters only for the time that I've needed them, maybe for an hour or less than that, where an hour seemed reasonable. But then I started thinking about why they were forcing me to limit myself and how many hours I had interpreters for. That was my experience last year, and I felt really conflicted about it. But now I know who I can talk to and who I can trust and who I can ask for advice. Luckily, I spoke with the right person in my case, and they knew who to talk to in turn for me. And I'm fortunate that the University of Rochester has a great team of interpreters already. Maybe, Bob, you were involved in that. I'm not sure. You really don't have to worry. Talk to the school. Educate them about what they can do. Make sure that the school does not limit you in whatever you need interpreter-wise. And clearly, for classes, you need interpreters. That's pretty black and white. But also outside of class, at informal gatherings, uh, interpreters are important too, and they really do need to learn about that. So it's important that you talk to the right people and not just have a visceral response and get upset. Think about it more rationally and think about who you can talk to about it. We need to identify who these individuals are, people that we can trust, like these two gentlemen on stage. There are two of our hearing allies. They support us as a deaf community, and we know their hearts are in the right place. Which means that if a problem or a conflict arises, we are able to talk with them and receive advisement. It may not always be a perfect solution, but at least it's progress. Really, I want to reinforce my point that it's not just an individual or two. That number can't do it. It takes many more to come forward, and that's part of the reason we are all here at this panel discussion. Not to talk negatively, no, but to think of a more positive future. With more of you involved, it means we have a stronger case, and hearing people can't just say no any longer. Also, self-advocacy is so important. How you share the information, how you educate those individuals, how you're able to articulate what your communication needs are. Talk about what has been effective before, what accommodations you have a proven history of. That will help you a great deal. As well, being able to explain the ADA, your right to effective communication. You should check out the website. There's a lot of information there where you can print and share links to medical schools and to law schools who want to learn more about the ADA. So the NAD is a great resource. Another great resource is the U.S. Department of Justice, the DOJ. They have a lot of information on their website as well that you can share with the graduate programs.
And I want to emphasize the importance of, again, sitting down, engaging that interactive process, having that discussion about what your needs are and what their concerns may be, and to come to some sort of compromise on a good solution. It's important that you have open communication, clear communication, you know, and also tap into the allies that are available to you at the same time. The first is that uh, as far as knowing the right people to go to, that's very important, as Tiffany pointed out, in particular because sometimes lower level people, let's say somebody at a department level or a department chair, et cetera, or an admissions committee member, simply doesn't know about the ADA sufficiently uh, to answer questions correctly. I can recall a situation some time back where a deaf person was applying to the clinical psychology program at the University of Rochester. And I received a call from this person because he or she said that when she was telephoning the, uh, you know, somebody in the clinical psychology program, that individual said, oh, our, our clinical psychology program couldn't afford to pay for the amount of interpreter services you would need, therefore you can't apply. And that reflects ignorance of, of the nature of the ADA where the, the, what we call the undue cost, the undue burden, uh, let's say, of, of, of fiscal costs is not judged at a department level or a program level or even at, quote unquote, the medical school level. It would be judged at the level of the entire budget of the entire University of Rochester. So that individual, by saying no to the applicant, put the University of Rochester at legal risk because they would have definitely lost a lawsuit because the, the, the undue burden is not based at a department level, it's based at the entire university level. So making sure you are talking to people who really know their stuff, as Tiffany pointed out, is important. The second uh, comment I wanted to make uh, has to do with another comment Tiffany made about what, what we refer to as the informal curriculum. Yes, of course, most people will understand that interpreter services or CART, et cetera, will be needed in a classroom didactic situation. But so much of learning, especially at graduate levels, at the at, you know, healthcare professional levels, happens outside the classroom, in social environments, in, in, in other what you would think of as somewhat informal meetings. But there's, there's a whole literature on quote unquote the informal curriculum. And it's very, very important that the informal curriculum, social meetings, et cetera, where you talk about work. Um, is accessible to you as well. So it, I would strongly encourage you and the persons you work with to advocate for interpreter services or whatever you might need in those informal yet important learning situations. The third comment I wanted to make was that, again, considering the difference between classroom didactic communication needs and the transition to communication needs, let's say in clinic settings where you're dealing with patients, implies that you know what your communications are even going to be like in those service settings. And that's, in my experience, what many deaf persons understandably wouldn't know. I mean, they know what a classroom's like. You've been in classrooms all your life. But how are you going to know what it's like to work on you know, this floor as a nursing student or that situation as a medical student? And so I've been in a number of situations where the school is expecting the student to advise them on what their communications are going to, excuse me, their communication needs are going to be in these clinical situations they've never experienced before. And so they can't, a student such as that can't predict those very well unless they have visited those situations or talked with faculty who can explain, well, here's what it's like to be in the emergency room, or here's what it's like to be you know, on this or, that, this or that floor. So be careful of that dilemma or that trap that you can't necessarily uh, advise a program on what your communication needs are going to be in a situation that you've never been in before. And that implies that you're going to need to find out about that clinical setting, et cetera, before you'll have any idea what your communication needs are going to be. If you are qualified for that, if you have good grades, then maybe you will be helped. But you will still have to educate more people because you are in a medical school and a research school. 
So I don't know. But if you're qualified, then I think it could improve your chances. My advice would be, go ahead and apply. Don't be afraid. Don't think that while I'm deaf, I can't get in. Follow your heart. I've had limited experience thus far. I've had some experience in family medicine on Tuesdays. I don't really notice a change. Actually, I feel like everything goes very smoothly, very streamlined. So I've had a good experience so far, mind you. For me, my biggest challenge was dictation. For hearing doctors, the way they increase their productivity is by dictation. They see patients fast and they dictate fast. But does that mean they provide good care? Who's to say? In terms of insurance versus good care, I think it's a balance. For me, dictation is a big challenge because I can't use that method. I had to figure out a different way. Sometimes I typed out my own reports, which had to take four to five hours in the evenings after I had been working all day. Or I'd have an interpreter there voicing what I signed, but then I would have to pay the interpreter too. So there are still some production issues that will affect deaf and hard of hearing professionals. There is always a way around it. We just do it differently. I think the key is that you have to find the right hearing people who are willing to work with you in that capacity. The world of medicine has changed a lot in the past 20 or 30 years. In the past, we had fee-for-service, which meant the patient would pay the doctor for each visit. Very straightforward. Now that insurance got involved, there is a certain dollar amount that is applied maybe for a 15-minute chunk of time, and that if you take longer than 15 minutes, as a doctor, you are told, you know, too bad, they won't add any more funds for reimbursement. Even if the result is better care for the patient, the insurance company unfortunately has their own system their own way that they judge value for service, and that's really based on hearing people's ideas, who are very productive, very individualistic, and based on speed, seeing a lot of patients. Insurance companies are following that business model. They are trying to maximize profits, of course, being the business they are in, so we will always have issues with that model. What are some of the technological advancements that you have seen thus far? For example, Dr. Chris spoke about the electronic medical record system. So what are some advancements you have seen or even see down the pipeline that could help support deaf professionals and practitioners working in the medical field? I remember in the past, doctors would have to wear masks that would make lip reading difficult. But now we have see-through masks. Advancements like these not only benefit deaf individuals, but also in turn benefit hearing individuals as well. What other advancements have you seen in the last few years? I use a stethoscope that connects directly to my implant, but there are other options as well where you can have a visual display. Uh, I haven't used that. I don't know if you'd like to talk about that, Scott. Yes, I did. I can speak to that. I have used a visual display that connects to a stethoscope, and it's a real-time wave that represents the sound of a heart. There are two normal heart sounds that we can expect to hear, and I can see those visually on the display. If there is a murmur, there will be an extra wave that shows up, visually displaying the murmur. I think it will be important in the future to have a device to display lung sounds. We don't have something perfected yet to identify lung sounds, but I have heard someone mention a tactile device that is placed on the patient, which increases the sensation felt. I'm lucky as a pediatrician because children have thinner skin and so it's easier for me to palpate and feel what it might sound like. This is true for some, but not all children. It depends. Some children are a little bit bigger, too. 
Some might have asthma. They're suffering from a wheeze. You can't always capture that. The point is, in the future, hopefully we will have more technology like that. It'll make jobs easier for deaf and hard of hearing people, regardless of the medical field they are in. I'd like to thank the panelists for their wisdom they've shared tonight. I hope you've all found this information helpful. I'd like to thank you all for joining us this evening. We do plan on having future panel discussions on various topics throughout the year. Hopefully you can plan on attending. And I'd like to once again thank our panelists.